Hare Krishna Radhika Ron Pro. Welcome back to the Monks podcast. Such a delight to have you back. It's always a pleasure Chaitanya Charan Prabhu to to be in your association. I think this is our third podcast uh, so far. Is that true? Yes, yes. And both our podcasts have been very well received. I mean the first was quite a marathon. We went for almost 3 hours. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> It was wonderful. So, you know this time uh, I thought I I read your article in the Scon Communication Journal about a Gaudiya Vaishnava eco theology. So I thought maybe that could be a topic for discussion today. And um, you okay with that? Yeah, it sounds excellent. Yes. So, you know, to begin with, I find that broadly there are four areas. We could say broadly in the Western world or even in the Westernized world, where you could say consciousness is coming towards global human consciousness is coming towards sattva. and maybe becoming more receptive to not just spirituality in general but also bhakti spirituality so yoga is one where it's bodily consciousness but there are more holistic ways of taking care of the body people have become open to that veganism is another where people have become conscious that we shouldn't be hurting other life forms then mindfulness is another where psychological problems we want to deal with them but not just in chemical ways we want to understand what is the mind and find more holistic ways to deal with the mind and the last is environmentalism or environmental consciousness where i feel that it's a that people are becoming aware that our actions have consequences and that we need to we need to take care of our earthly abode uh, earthly residents more and so not only are these indicative of a broader pers- or broader vision of life a broader aware and expanded awareness but also so we could say the expanded awareness is sign of sattva but there is also an openness for spiritual wisdom in addressing these issues so what do you think about this uh, i i think that's a wonderful summary to on uh what is um the, the 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 major trends that we find in the direction of spirituality and bhakti in 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 the, in popular culture in the world and in intellectual circles so i i that's that's a wonderful analysis uh, i can say from my own um perspective in working in university classrooms and teaching at the university when i teach a uh, courses on world religions and we go through a variety of different traditions or when i teach specific courses on hinduism uh the, the there there are two areas that my students use to you know um assess the viability validity quality of any religious tradition <clears throat> and um and, and this has been true at multiple universities not just that i've i've taught now at you know four different universities and and at each one these tend to be consistent measures uh when they're looking for you know is this a religious tradition that i could stand next to that i could exist within that i could live with um or just in terms of assessing its quality there's two things they look at uh one is uh how does this tradition treat um its women and and give voices to women uh and secondly uh how does it offer solutions for our contemporary world issues especially the environment with respect to the environment i see that uh... the issue has also become a little bit politicized in the sense that while there is an acknowledgement that the environment has deteriorated but that and it has significantly deteriorated but it seems that between the left and the right there is polarization and maybe because the issue has become commercialized and because the issue has also become you know it is some people are using it to gain to make to score political points so sometimes in some circles environmental issues is polarizing but beyond beyond that for a vast majority there is concern the magnitude of concern may vary but the i don't think the problem itself is being denied by anyone so the magnitude of the problem and the nature of the solutions what all we can do what all we should do for solving there might be some debates about that but even within mm-hmm. that there is openness to various approaches for how to solve the problems 
isn't it overall yes yes i agree i agree i i think it's 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 this is this issue is also coming to a point in the world where especially for the next generation uh it's it's not a question of if it's an issue it's just a question of how we need to address it and 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 to what degree and in what ways what's the best way to address it that the politicization of it is is a reality um and you know i i live in the united states where it's highly politicized and i think other places in the world also the environment gets politicized but i think precisely because it's politicized we uh, as gaudiya vaishnavas as 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 followers of the vedic tradition have the opportunity to provide a fresh perspective that that um that 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 cuts beyond uh you know the 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 often very petty fights that take place to score political points or to promote my party or your party that kind of thing so this is precisely why we have an option to give spiritual solutions to material problems okay so now when you say that well uh, about spiritual solutions to material problems there are various kinds of material problems which we can deal with and as devotees at one level prabhupad was very environmentally prescient that from what i have read uh, among the various environmental leaders that we have the, uh, among the various spiritual leaders that from india went to the west uh, not many really emphasize a lot about uh, lifestyle and certainly about simple living it was more about you know add yoga add some mantra med- mantra add some mantra add some meditation to your life but prabhupad talked a lot about he didn't probably use the word eco friendly that time but he talked about simple living lives on a farm and having using cows and uh, with a cow and a piece of land so in that sense what prabhupad offered was also a very uh, although the message was transcendental but he offered very tangible real world applications of the transcendental message yes and 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 i think shri prabhupad was was visionary like he was in, in 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 so many things he was visionary in in this respect in this aspect of uh of of placing before us a goal as devotees to uh, live in such in such a way in in the, in the world that we practice our krishna consciousness as our first priority and at the same time we relate to the world in a way that is simple that is sustainable that is in touch with as his famous phrase land cows and krishna right and so that that foundation these three things he said if you have land cows and krishna then life is good there's no there's no um there's no problem uh, those basic problems are there janma mrityu jaravya but we can live in this world in such a way that we can live comfortably while also remaining focused on our ultimate aim and so that encouragement that prabhupad gave which gave uh, and that that insistence in creating spiritual communities that are based on land cows and krishna that's something that we have yet to accomplish right we're working in that direction there's wonderful you know examples of that that are developing uh, but but it's it's an area that we have a lot to do in uh, on on a on an international scale on a on a society wide scale to really provide an example and it it really is something that the world is looking towards there's there's um, uh, now um a whole variety of ecologically conscious communities in the world uh, often they're called anticipatory communities yeah uh, communities that you know anticipate a, a better vision for the world and they come from a variety of backgrounds uh, some are christian some are more secular humanist in approach and with govardhan eco village we see a wonderful example of a of a um, you know gaudiya vaishnav example of what such a um ecologically aware community uh, may look like and it's it, it's 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 perfectly in sync with what the world needs but it's also more importantly it's a direct result of the proper practice of krishna consciousness interesting so i have been in gaurdhaniko village and 
what i found i've been staying here for more than a year now during the pandemic i visited here before also so two three things i noticed about this is that firstly it radically transforms people's understanding of what krishna consciousness is you know, my brother i used to he is based in america and he stays he he is appreciative of what i am doing he is appreciative of his con but appreciative from a distance you come visit me talk for some time he came here and he's he look at the whole eco friendly thing he spent some time with the cows he spent some time in various things and he said next time i am going to come i am going to stay for several days over here so he is i would say a representative of that indian westernized young person who is was delighted to see what to, uh, i'm just giving that as an example of an indian westernized person what to speak of western people they delighted to see such a expanded or expansive understanding of what bhakti spirituality means so it it is quite uh, it opens new i would say that i i tend to use this metaphor that say if we have a temple and the deity at the center there can be different doors to come into the temple and have the darshan of the deity so we could say that normal temples and the people we having direct devotional program they are like the the main entrance from which most majority of people will come but there are many other doors that can be opened for people to uh, gain an appreciation for krishna and come closer to krishna so the environment does open uh, environmental consciousness and if we are doing something to promote green living based on spiritual understanding then that does open doors for a lot of people who would otherwise not be interested mm. i i totally agree i mean from an outreach perspective it's something essential um when when shila prabhupad came to the united states uh, it, it was during the time of the of of heavy protests against the vietnam war mm-hmm. and and uh, again, and against the idea of war in general and prabhupad uh, wrote about and spoke about the peace formula as you know provided from bhagavad gita how can there be real peace in the world he addressed the concerns of the time and uh, although you know war con- continues to remain a very significant uh, concern but today you know the dominant concern uh, again and again uh, is is uh, is ecology is the environment and it becomes our duty as followers of shila prabhupada as members of a long standing ancient tradition that has always responded to the concerns of the time it becomes our duty to address this concern and respond to it as well and 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 let me emphasize that this is not just some sort of a a pr move where you know it, this is what people want to see so we got to show something to to as a as a, some sort of practice to to uh, um uh, seduce them to come and practice krishna consciousness uh, th- It, that that is not the case this is it it is the nature of a vaishnava and the vaishnav tradition throughout history to address the concerns the issues the problems the worries that people have in 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 broader society and to show how krishna consciousness can not only provide a way out but also a way to flourish in the here and now at a way to flourish in this world to live in this world in a peaceful holistic way simple living and and high thinking yeah this is uh i would say that in one sense our own understanding of krishna consciousness individually and collectively as a as a society has expanded earlier i was talking with uh, sri prabhupada disciple a few months ago in a podcast he said that our mood was that that you know within a f- few years we are going to take over the world and a short time after that we are all going to become pure devotees and go back to godhead so the idea was that there was this mood of revolution but the quantity of the work so the that was required for bringing about a substantial change that was massively underestimated so that's why the world was seen simply as an arena for preaching and then an arena for getting out of this world 
But beyond that, now of course, we do want to attain Krishna's abode. We do want to share Krishna Bhakti over here. But it requires a much more deeper engagement with the world beyond what can be negatively called as proselytization. Yes, very much so. Uh, there's, there's no... Um, I, I, I think the idea that we can take over the world is still very much true. It's a reality. It's a possibility. But not taking over the world in some militaristic sense or in some you know, triumphalistic sense. But I, I prefer to think of it, uh, I like this, um, this really nice example that the Amish give, the, this uh, pacifist Christian community that you uh, find in, in parts of the United States, that, uh, that we have to be like the, the, the leaven in the bread, the, the yeast in the bread, right? It may be only one teaspoon of yeast that you put in the bread, but it raises the entire mixture of flour and so on and transforms the entire bread into bread, into flour, into bread, right? So it, we, there, there, it, it may, may not be that, that, that everyone is, is a devotee, that everyone is shaved up, that everyone is wearing hilak. Uh, certainly the numbers will grow. But the point is that our presence in the world and our attempt to live in a uh, exemplary way, right? It will raise the consciousness of the entire society, of the entire global community. Uh, not just that we're an island unto ourselves that you know doesn't affect anything, we just do our own thing, but that our presence in the world should be such that whether they are you know, part of the uh, ISKCON community or Vaishnav community or not, it doesn't matter. Our presence, the presence of a devotee within a community, within a neighborhood, within a city, within a town, the presence of a Vaishnava should be such that that presence uplifts the consciousness of and uplifts the, the vitality and, and the happiness of everyone in that neighborhood, everyone in that community, like the way that yeast raises the entire loaf of bread. That's quite a striking example. Very practical because it's something which everybody experiences in the sense of yeast something. So we could say that to some extent, Bhaktivinoda Thakur was like that. The, mm. Then after that, I think the subsequent Acharyas, Bhaktivinoda Thakur and Bhaktivinoda 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 Prabhupada, they were more, you could say, spiritual leaders who were in the renounced order. And that's Prabhupada was in the Grahastha Ashram, but we know him more in the renounced order. So in that sense, Maybe the ethos shifted more to, to recruiting people into the movement rather than, you could say, transforming the world itself from where it is. So, yeah, so I think as, uh, as so for example, in the academia itself, we have had devotees and which was a book I was reading recently, which said that Hinduism itself is, is massively underrepresented in the academic study of religion, except for one exception, which is, which is ISKCON and Gaudiya Vaishnavism. There's an impressive number of young scholars who have joined and that they have set an example for others, other traditions also to enter. I think that has happened in the last 10, 20 years. Uh, who, where did I read this? In one of the books on Hinduism, I read that. So I think that's an example of uh, spirituality. Yes. And, and I think it's natural uh, in the course of a movement's development for that to take place. I mean, th this vision is there in, in Srila Prabhupada very, very clearly as well in terms of the development of Vaishnav communities, of, as you were describing, farm communities, simple living and high thinking. Uh, it, it, it's, 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 it's a vision that he put before us for us to develop in due course of time. At, in, in the initial stage of a, a movement's development, one has to go out and, and be a revolutionary band that, that you know, um, grows and that focuses on expansion. And then as Prabhupada gave the example of boiling the milk, right? And then you expand and then you have to cook it down uh, um, uh, more and more and more until it's something, something becomes very rich and then you expand again, you add more milk and you cook it down. And so this is, this is you know, how we make this uh, koya, this is how we make this condensed milk nice sweets and preparation is by that process, right? So, so yes, both of those work 
in sync with each other. It's not that one is better than the other, but the process of expansion and then condensation. Expansion, condensation have to work hand in hand with each other. And, and it's the, 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 the putting down of roots and settling down and becoming involved in communities is a natural process when a movement develops, um, uh, 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 when it matures. And after it has grown, it's gone through a phase of, of really fast expansion, then it's very natural for those who are there to settle down and to diversify in the types of professions they engage in, how they engage in their communities. Uh, because we saw that shift in ISKCON, right? From uh, being the renunciate tradition, as you're saying, to being primarily a family-based Krihasta tradition. And these types of concerns about the environment and ecology are primarily concerns for uh, Grihastas. They're primarily concerns for people who are inv involved and engaged in their societies and their communities. They, they cannot avoid, they cannot walk away from such situations, whether it is the, 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 the situation with, with you know, uh, homelessness and hunger in their communities, or it's the destruction of the natural environment, or it's safety within your neighborhood. These are things, as, as, a, as, as family people in this world, one would be naturally concerned with, right? It's not whether one is a devotee or one is not a devotee, it's just a human concern. Uh, and mm -hmm. if you don't want to approach it in a Krishna conscious way, it's not that you will avoid the issue, you will just avoid it, you will just approach it in a non-Krishna conscious way, right? I, I cannot avoid uh, uh, being engaged with my neighborhood. Why? Because I have to live with my neighbors. I have to live in my, in my uh, uh, community. And I have, when my children play outside, I want them to be safe and I want them to have good friends and everything. So I have to be engaged in my neighborhood. Now I have a choice. I can be engaged as a devotee in a Krishna conscious way, or I can be engaged like everyone else in a secular fashion. That's the choice I have. To be engaged or not to be engaged, that's not a choice. I have, right? I'm I'm a family man. This is this is my this is my reality, right? So so I I think I think this is a natural transition in ISKCON because we are majority composed of family people of grihastas, and therefore our c concerns about the environment, engagement with people's health, you know, all of these things, this is this is unavoidable as a reality. Hmm. Good point and. Not only is it unavoidable, we could say it's also, it's a, it's a, it's a positive thing. It's a, as you said, not only it's functionally required, but that's how a spiritual movement, you could say, becomes more gradually influential at different levels in in, in human society. Mm -hmm. So, with respect to the environment, now just taking this point of engage Vaishnavism a little bit forward, that. Uh, there are two levels. One is uh, utilitarian in the sense that, uh, okay, like this is for PR purposes or this is what we need to do. But the other is more of an intellectual, intellectually grounded and spiritually directed. So one is because of simply social or functional necessity. Now, if we don't do this, we'll get into trouble. But we can do this because this is a part of our tradition itself, as you said. So are there examples in our tradition of, say, previously of leaders getting involved in social issues, which we can so, draw as a precedent on? Yes, yes. Uh, I, just, I, to, just uh, to qualify this, now, yeah. it does seem that especially when the, when say when India was under Islamic rule, most mm. Indian spiritual leaders didn't seem to get involved in the political dimensions of the struggle. So the Goswamis, they were not involved in any political intrigues to try to overthrow the Mughal rulers. Or even for that matter, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu didn't try to do anything with the rule of Nawab Hussain Shah. So of course, that's a specific political thing. But that those some of those examples are often given that we are not so much into our tradition is not so much into world transformation. It is more for world transcending. Individually, of course, we transcend, but society just like we don't bother because it's just too complicated. Mm. Any thoughts about yeah. that? 
Yeah, this is this is a um, this is a, a a very important question and a concern that you've raised. And in fact, um, when you asked the question, the the first people I thought of were the six Goswamis of Vrindavan. Really? And uh, yes, and specifically Shila Jiva Goswami. Um, I I. I um, let me start by saying that these are six devotees who are at the very foundation, at the core of our entire sampradaya. And they are 100% renunciates, vairagis, right? So going back to my original point, whatever we find in them, we can multiply by 10 at least for grihastas, right? Like Srila Bhakti Vinodha. Uh, because... <laughs> <laughs> what what I, the examples I'm going to give is despite the fact, this is my point, this is despite the fact that they are vairagis of the highest order, that they're living under a different tree each night. So anyway, so Srila Jeeva Goswami in particular, he, he, was, um, he was deeply involved in not just the philosophical and theological foundations of our movement, but also in its social, political, and legal health as well. He's someone who we might say, um, you know, had hands-on engagement with these aspects of our tradition. He was, like many of us are, he was born and raised in the second generation of the movement after Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu, right? As the, as, the, as, the, uh, as the founder of the movement and the six Goswamis as the direct associates and followers. And then those, the, the five Goswamis left everything in the hands of Srila Jiva Goswami. Uh, the temples that they had built, the libraries that they had collected, um, the, the, the books that they had written, right? All of that was left. It was bequeathed to Jiva Goswami. And Srila Jiva Goswami, he engaged with, um, he was very aware of the political realities of his time and the legal realities. And dare I say, he was on the cutting edge of these aspects in terms of engaging with them for the welfare of the Vaishnav community at the time. Uh, in fact, he, um, uh, so for example, the Govinda Dev temple was there uh, and Madan Mohan Mandir and all of that. The fact that these temples today are still standing is directly a result of the legal work that Srila Jiva Goswami did. You see, Vrindavan was located in such a place in the plains, uh, in the fertile plains of North India, and in a place where very close to Delhi, so that for generations, uh, for literally a millennia, anytime a ruler needed uh, in, in Delhi needed some extra funds to add to his treasury uh, or needed to build up support or whatever, he would come through with his army and raid Vrindavan, destroy temples and, and uh, you know, collect money from the treasury, loot things and then go back. This happened again and again in the history of Vrindavan. Uh, the, the, after the time of the six Goswamis, we have the famous ruler, Aurangzeb, right? The, and and he, he, he raised so many temples to the ground. But the fact that the Goswami temples are still standing, I mean, Govindaji Mandir lost a few stories, but it's still there. And Madan Mohan is still there. All these temples are still there, are because in the time of Akbar, Srila Jiva Goswami worked with the, uh, uh, the emperors in Delhi to create legal documents. We have records of all of these legal documents preserving and promising that these temples would remain in the hands of Gaudiya Vaishnavas for the future. How did he do this? Not by going directly to the Mughals, but by working with the most important allies of the Hindu community who were in favor with the Mughals, which, as you know, were the Rajputs. So we have, we have documents from Raja Todarmal, for example, in Rajasthan, who says that, um, who, who worked with Srila Jiva Goswami to get the favor of Akbar and others in the Mughal court in, in Delhi. And we have a firman from Akbar saying that uh, we hereby uh, bequeath the land of the Govindavji temple to Jiva Goswami, a poor and worshipful man. This is how he describes Srila Jiva Goswami. Very, very sweet, actually. Yeah. A poor and worshipful man. Right? So, so uh, this is just one example. 
One more example I'll give. He, Jiva Goswami wrote a will uh, specifying how the worship of the temples under his care should go on, particularly Govindevji temple, and specifying how the, the properties associated with it should be cared for. He left a final will and testament. Now, this may not seem like a big deal to us today, but scholars study Jiva Goswami's will as the earliest example of a testamentary document of a will in Indian history. Right? His, this will that's visible at the Vrindavan Research Institute is the earliest example. What I mean to say is maybe there were other examples at the time beforehand that we don't have preserved. We don't know whether it's actually the first or not. But the point is that Jiva Goswami was at the cutting edge of legal instruments in India at the time. No one used wills before that time, right? Uh, in order to preserve the Gaudiya Vaishnav legacy. So uh, we, we have many examples. And, and this is like I'm saying, this is a Vairagi of the highest order uh, who is doing this, right? It's, it's, not, it's not, he's not a Grihastha. He's not, you know, doesn't have a job, right? All of that. And yet as, as a leader of the movement, he shows his concern for political and legal realities of his time. And the Goswamis in general, Bhira, Bhira, Jana, Priya, Priya, Karo, right? With Sanatan Goswami, we see that example of how he's engaged in the community, not just of, you know, pure Vaishnavas, but just the simple villagers in the community concerned about their lives and contributing around them and much love. So this is an example of the Goswamis, of of, of how engagement in our community, in our society, in our world is a very natural thing for a Vaishnava. It's not something we have to plot and plan. It happens naturally when we are Vaishnavas and we live in this world as a devotee. That's amazing. It is so radically different from maybe, maybe just my preconception. And generally, we talk about Jiva Goswami Siddhanta Acharya. We talk about him as a deep philosoph deeply philosophical person. We read the Sandarvas, we see depth of his philosophical thought also. But it's fascinating about the legal documents. When you're speaking this, I was also thinking that how careful Prabhupada was mm. with respect to the Juhu temple. And yeah. many of the devo other devotees involved were having no experience. But Prabhupada orchestrated the you could say the battle for the Juhu war in such a way that eventually we, uh, for the Juhu temple in such a way that we won it. And so this point by point, you know, you do this, do this when the temple was demolished, how Prabhupada turned it into a PR victory, although it was a, it was heartbreaking to have the temple broken. So it, this, this aspect of, uh, about Prabhupada, what it said, I think, I presume we can apply that for Jiva Goswami also. His head was in the sky, but his feet were firmly planted on the ground. Yes. And we, we see that throughout our legacy, Prabhu. Bhaktivinoda Thakur is a wonderful example of that, where he says how this engagement with the world and people's concerns for food, clothing, medicine, this is a symptom, he says, a sign of a Vaishnav culture. That's how he puts it, right? And you see with Srila Prabhupada and his famous statement that no one within miles of, a, of our temples, of the Mayapur temple in particular, should go hungry, uh, right? And, and this, is not, this was not just some... PR move on Prabhupada's part. Uh, this, this, was, this was a product of his natural compassion as paradukha dukhi, uh, as, as the natural kripa of a Vaishnava. Those, the, that, that, that effect that it had on Srila Prabhupada to see that scene in Mayapur of children fighting with dogs for food. This was, this was, this was something that touched the, the heart of a pure devotee, of a, of a Vaishnava. So, we, the, the, the PR is a, we may have to do things for PR purposes. It may be a, 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 a byproduct, but the, the marker of a Vaishnava is that uh, he or she is not hypocritical, right? That they are the same inside and outside. That's the marker of a Vaishnava, that as far as possible, what is inside is what is outside. There's no two layers. There's no two masks that we wear in this circumstance. We are Vaishnavas through and through. So if we do something for a for a purpose of PR, for the purpose of in you know uh, uh, whatever it might be, then then it has to come from a genuine place, right? It has to be the product of of a truth that we live and that we embody, uh, not just that we that we that we show. Right? 
Hmm. Good point. You know, many times devotees feel that as if I'm living two lives, one as a devotee and one as a professional. But if we have a more integrated understanding of Krishna consciousness, ultimately Krishna can be served in the temple. Krishna can be served in the home. Krishna can be served in the workplace also. So, yes. so if we have, then then that one doesn't feel. Yes, the the ways in which I'm going to do service may be different. So, in the way you say you might talk about. Krishna Bhakti in academic class may be different from the way you might talk about it in a devotee program, and that is something which is there for even for me. Now, if I am going giving speaking to yoga audience of primarily yoga students in the West, and if I speaking a Bhagavatam class in India, uh, there will be different the the way I will speak, but it will be Krishna's message ultimately. So in one sense, there is there is responsiveness to time, place, circumstance. by the same time in their responsiveness there is a underlying common thread of you could say responsibility that i am meant to serve krishna here so both both yes. go together nicely hmm. very well stated bro very nice yes true so now and this is a it is a very beautiful foundation for what we led so this is, see there is a practical level of engagement where we work for certain causes and we could say there is a more of a philosophical or theological level of engagement so in one sense with respect to the environment devotees if one cause of the environmental uh, challenges that we face is excessive consumption then as devotees just by our following the four regulatory principles by our by practicing bhakti we start living simply so to some extent we could say that our our levels of consumption may naturally go down that is more of the lifestyle aspect of it at the same time there could also be a deeper level of theological engagement where you know why should we care for the environment uh, there is uh, just to elaborate on this point that the, if we see the mainstream direction of uh, the intellectual or the in the world view today it's increasingly secularized and uh, secularized is basically a more polite word for non theistic if not atheistic but mm. even within that there are people there are there are people who with concern for the environment they are recognizing that if we want people to take care of the environment just giving them doomsday prophecies this is a big problem this is a big problem stop doing this stop doing this that is not going to be enough so there are there's a transform if transformation is to be brought about in people's lives that has to be coming from inside out and they are also recognizing that that uh, we need uh, to connect with the religious and spiritual traditions of the world i had a podcast with gorang prabhu where he talked about the concept of faith based organizations and he was saying that iskon is also being recognized as a faith based organization and like we have non governmental organizations the faith based organizations are the organizations that this is a unit of organizations the united nations works with uh, and they say that because they are faith based they have a significant influence on a particular demographic and we can channel that influence for addressing issues of global concern like say the environment one of them so i am making two points by this first is that uh, there is a recognition that we need to draw towards religious and spiritual aspects uh, or religious and spiritual resources for transforming people uh, so there could be a, but there is often a utilitarian approach like one of the pioneers who wrote this declaration that we need to draw on the spiritual resources so i think in united nations conference uh, he is known to be an atheist but he said we need to infuse the or is word there we need to infuse a vision of the sacred in people's understanding of nature although in one perspective if there is no god is there something sacred so there could be a utilitarian approach from us as devotees and there could be a utilitarian approach from the outside world to use say whatever is religious or spiritual theology or practices are there for each other's purposes so how do we ensure a deeper level of authenticity 
that we are not just simply using, nor are we simply getting used. Any thoughts on this? Yes. Um, uh, uh, th this is, I, I think you've raised a very important issue uh, that um, sometimes um, others can see religious communities in a utilitarian way. And also devotees can see this sort of uh, engagement as a utilitarian uh, sort of engagement. And, and, um, and, and, and I think, I think both, uh, both do a disservice. I mean, both, both are coming from the perspective of how can I get something from the situation, right? Sure. But, but the, the, the reality and, and people will approach things like that. And, and it's not, it's not necessarily a bad thing uh, to find utility in one thing or another. But the reality is that, um, as I was saying earlier, as devotees, when we, when we enter some sort of engagement, uh, then we, we, we should go into something only uh, if we can be genuine and authentically a Vaishnava through and through. Uh, that, that for a devotee to be deceptive, to be two-faced, to be different inside and outside is different, it is, is, not, is not appropriate. Now, Desha Kalapat, the time, place, and circumstance is different. That deals with application. Application of eternal principles in a variety of different circumstances. How, how do you apply according to time, place, and circumstance? That has to do with application. But the principles that drive that application are eternal. They are, they are siddhantic. They don't change with time, place, and circumstance. They are not shaped by time, place, and circumstance, but they respond to time, place, and circumstance. And there's a big difference between the two, right? So as Vaishnavas, when there are utilitarian uh, uh, engagements, which, like I said, is a reality in the world, and this is how the world works, then when there's a utilitarian opportunity, then we have to think, how do I respond to this as a Vaishnava? Not, uh, uh, not that... I shift my principles, uh, that I modify my principles uh, in order to um, uh, fit whatever it is that's going on. And this is why I think when we engage uh, in environmental concerns as devotees, when we engage in any kind of worldly concern as devotees, it's important that we ask ourselves, how do I contribute to this situation in a Vaishnav way? Uh, I, it, sometimes there can be a tendency to jump on the bandwagon and just go, go with, with the flow, wherever everyone's going. Yes, yes, yes. Gita also says this, right? Uh, you're saying this? Yes, Gita also says this. Uh, actually, there's a verse for this also. And the tendency is natural. But the point is we have to stop first. And we have to ask ourselves, I don't, the goal of a devotee is not to engage with the world by agreeing with everything that the world does. No. The, 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 a devotee engages with the world by making a genuine Vaishnav contribution that, is, that may be unique and the world needs to hear. As Gaudiya Vaishnavas, we have a unique contribution to make to the environments, environmental issues in the world. I'll give you one example. It is very popular these days to speak of the world as a beautiful place, right? You celebrate, if you celebrate Earth Day, uh, at least here in the United States, it's celebrating the beauty and the wondrous glory of the world and how everything is so beautiful and people are good and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's, it's, a, it's a very popular thing to, even in environmental circles, to start with the assumption that the world is a beautiful place, that it can be a perfect place because that's how, way, that's how it's supposed to be, and then progress from there. Then talk about how depressing the situation actually is and how much work we have to do. To, to match the reality with that vision. We don't have to jump onto the world as a beautiful place bandwagon, right? We, we don't have to jump onto that train because the, the, the Gita, the Vedas say very clearly that this material world is a Dukhalayam Shashwata. It's a miserable place. It's a suffering place. And it's not a perfect place. It's perfect for its function, but it's not, you know, it's Janma Mithu Jaravyati Dukkha Doshanu Darshana. And this is something not just Vaishnava say, but it's agreed upon uh, widely by all branches of the Vedantic tradition 
It's agreed upon by Buddhists, by Jains, by all the Indic tradition, right? A good chunk of the world's religious tradition see the world in this way. And this is a perspective that can help contribute to the world's environmental issues by changing the narrative, by changing the expectations. And you, by saying, no, we're not going to start with the assumption that the world is a beautiful and perfect place, that it's meant to be that way. And then talk about how depressing the situation is. Because the reality is, you know, when for people who work in environmental condition, uh, engagement, the, the number one personal challenge for them, the emotional challenge, is that they... Um, that it, it becomes, the work becomes very depressing over time. Uh, that there, there's so much to do and so little progress, and it feels like you are swimming upstream. No matter how much effort you do, the world's problems only increase, right? They don't decrease. And, and, this, and, and, and the Vaishnava perspective can offer a very, uh, very helpful moderating aspect to this by saying, look, the, making the world a perfect, beautiful place is not our goal. It's not going to happen. Yet, what we can do to make the world a livable place so that we can achieve our ultimate goals, that's what we're trying to achieve, right? We're not going to set the bar at some place that is impossible. We're going to set the bar someplace that is practical. And if you cannot if your work doesn't transform the world into perfection, that's okay, because it's not meant to be that way anyhow. It's just the nature of the world that it's going to have its issues in its problems. So our perspective of Dukale and Mashashwatam can provide a very valuable voice in the current environmental discourse that takes place. And, and that underscores my broader point, which is that we don't have to just go along with what everyone's saying. Application, engagement with the world, according to Desh Kalapatra, does not mean simply uh, uh, towing the line, right? It, it means engagement by offering a genuine Vaishnava perspective that we can truly live as devotees, that is authentic. It's remarkable that the statement that the world is a place of distress can actually bring positivity. In one sense, it's like uh, if you are in a hospital, there are always going to be sick people. And unless you accept the baseline, the hospital is going to be a place of suffering. There is a place where there's going to be pain, there is going to be suffering. But what can you do to minimize it? Yes. So unless you set the baseline expectation right, it, it can have very counterproductive results. Yes. So one of the things which I have noticed in the environmental movement is that... Uh, there is, there is almost a self-righteous streak of misanthropy. It's like humanity is a problem and it's almost like a hatred of humanity. Humanity is the burden on the earth. And in one sense, I have two different perspectives to this, that it's not that human beings deliberately went about trying to destroy and destabilize the environment. No, it is not that with a sinister agenda, we tried to do it. Of course, you could say Rajoguna was there, some Tamaguna was there. But at one level, as science and technology started developing, it was just an attempt to survive. Hmm. Okay, these are these diseases, how do we deal with them? How do we survive? And yes, in, as we were surviving, we started expanding our influence. So hmm. to po what happens when we if we don't have this baseline understanding that the world is a place of distress, then we attribute all the problems that are there in the world to or in the environmental problems to humanity rather than to the nature of the world. And then that leads to quite a hatred for humanity, which I don't think is healthy. Mm. <laughs> so uh, to, to both of these points you made, Prabhu, uh, excellent, wonderful points. Uh, on, on the hospital example, I like that very much. Uh, sometimes sometimes uh, devotees may feel that, uh, you know, the Shastras say that the world is a miserable place anyway, and things are going to get worse in Kali Yuga. Therefore, what's the use? What's the use of doing anything for the good of the world, um, you know, other than getting people out of it? What's the use of caring for the environment? Uh, this is all uh, pointless endeavor. Uh, but, but 
that's that's not our philosophy and the, the, nor is it nor is it a very practical perspective to take on the world and 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 the finest example of this is disease right uh, we are told repeatedly that janma mrityu jaravyati this is a reality birth death old age and disease it's a reality in our in our life we will no one not even brahma will escape this, right so we get sick with some kind of disease what's our response anyway we're going to get sick and it's keep going to getting sick so let me not take care of this infection and let me let it just seep through the whole body and let it be you know let it go on no of course not i know i'm going to get sick again yet i'm willing to deal with this sickness so that my life can go on in as reasonable and peaceful a fashion as possible so the the social body is exactly the same way right the the idea of the social body goes back to the rigveda itself where the society is the body of the virat purusha so this the idea of the social body is the same way yes the social body is going to be diseased yes the global community yes the natural world is going to have its problems dukhale mashashvatam we even know it'll get it'll get worse in the course of time and yet that there is no logical or theological argument to go from that reality to the idea that therefore we have to do nothing about it right? that that's a logical leap that has no that is an illogical leap i should say it's a it's a logical fallacy to go from the nature of reality in the world is that it's just you know it's it's dukhale mashashvatam to the response that i should do nothing about it if a doctor were to take that perspective then the world you know everyone would die of the current pandemic right you know that a pandemic is going to make things worse in due course of time when a pandemic begins you know it's going to get worse before it gets better that's the reality that's how pandemics work does that mean therefore because it's going to get worse anyway you're going to stop attempting to help the person who's right in front of you thankfully no for those of us who have dealt with such issues and we've had to take avail ourselves of such medical care we know that we can trust that doctor to deal with the issue at hand and improve the situation even if he has no control of the trajectory of the global world's health altogether right so that 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 um that uh, we we have to we have to keep that broader perspective in mind we're never going to win in the sense that the world will be perfect and yet precisely because of that we have to do what we can to uh be present as a salutary agent in this world right as a salutary agent in this world. so that's to your the first point uh um, dr ekodes is uh, we have within the vedic tradition itself you talk about pandemic but even within the vedic tradition itself we have this branch of a uh, branch of medicine ayurveda and another sig- a significant point of ayurveda is that it does not it does not invoke divinity constantly as a cause of problems or as a solution to problems in some ways uh ayurveda is actually quite methodologically naturalistic that okay these are the these are the elements which comprise the body their balance is what maintains the health and if they become imbalanced these are the natural substances you can put in the body in the form of medicines to fix the problem so so to so the same tradition which says disease is an unavoidable problem of the world offers a entire body of knowledge to deal with diseases and it's a body of knowledge which acknowledges the existence of divinity but its functionality it is quite naturalistic i'm not saying naturalistic in an atheistic sense that it mm. focuses on material causes and material phenomena to address the problems so that idea that just because yeah. a problem can't be eliminated doesn't mean that it doesn't need to be attended to or that we let yes. it exacerbate that there is no justification for that uh, within our tradition yes very well stated yes very nice yes bro and 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 your second point that you raised uh, remind me again yes, uh, after the yeah so i was making this point that on one side we talk about the the as a talk there's a certain level of misanthropy that might come up when was that the point you were talking about yes 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 so so i remember now so so that's what i wanted to mention is that i've i've noticed um uh this this myself in bhagavatam that that when it, to, to this point i mean uh is that 
if you if you study Srimad Bhagavatam and you look at the role of of um, of uh, uh, human beings in Srimad Bhagavatam, then the way the Bhagavatam takes the presence of human beings is not as an external factor that is dropped into the world uh, after it's all set up, uh, but as rather uh, integral to the world's ecology, right? So the creation of human beings, it just follows the creation of everything else. And, and the world, just like the world cannot function without the presence of plants and trees, right? It, 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 cannot, it cannot function. Just as the world cannot function without the presence of animals, without the presence of water and mountains and, and the sun and the moon. So the world also cannot function without the presence of human beings. Human beings have specific roles to play in the dharmic cycle of this world. And, 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 and so we are integral to it. And I think this idea that human beings somehow are dropped onto the world and that they're placed, that, that, that they're placed here to then manipulate the world and they always walk two inches above the earth. This is not a Vaishnava idea. It's not a Bhagavat idea. Dare I say, it's not a, it's not a Indic idea in general about the place of human beings in, in, in the world. Uh, rather, human beings uh, have a special role to play by virtue of our intelligence and our spiritual, uh, especially our spiritual uh, capacity. But, but that role is, is one amongst the roles of so many other aspects of the natural world. And, and human beings, we, we need to have human beings on the earth. The, the earth needs us, Bhumi Devi needs us to play our role. It's just that we have to act according to our dharma, according to our dharmic uh, duty, our nature, according to the natural order of things. In the Vedas, this is called Rita, the natural order of, of the world. Uh, just like everything else does. Animals do and plants do this by instinct, by being forced by their natures. Human beings have more, more flexibility. And so we have the ability to, to, to veer away from Rita, from the natural order. And this is why the question of dharma then applies only to human beings, is because we have that option to veer away, whereas others don't. But we're as much part of Rita, of the natural order, as everything else. There's no, there's no separate... You know, it's not like we're, we're some extraneous feature. Oh, okay. So this is two, two points, interestingly. So the idea that uh, we human beings are integral to nature, I think uh, the Bhagavatam even takes it further in the 11th canto where there is this uh, description of the, the Lord of all, there's a verse which says, the Lord of all living beings, after he made all life forms, he made humans who had the capacity to inquire about spiritual, about Nishreyas, about the ultimate self-interest or ultimate purpose of life. And then he felt that the creation was completed. So in one sense, it's both from an existential perspective as well as from a transcendent perspective. Mm. Humans complete the process of creation, if you could say. Without yes. humans, it, it would just be the samsara chakra going on and on endlessly. And all living yes. beings in the samsara chakra endlessly. Yes, 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 very much so. And, 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 and think about how Bhagavatam describes even the creation of a simple element like water. When it defines, third canto, it dis defines water as, as something which is wet and something that flows, right? All these attributes that we will say physical attributes of water, a physicist with, will agree with. But that's not it. It also defines water as something that is cooling, that removes tiredness, and refreshes someone. Now, these are subjective qualities of water. Means even at, at the level of bare physical elements, the Bhagavata is describing not an objective creation, but a subjective creation. Even at the very beginning of creation, the subjective perceiver is already present, right? The perceiver, the experiencer is already present. So, so there's no such thing as a natural world independent of the perceiver, the subjective perceiver. The subjective perceiver is always there right at the beginning, whether it may be in the form of Brahma, or it may be in the form of the sages, or it may be in the form of human beings. We are part of the very foundations, the very fabric of the world itself. 
Beautiful. I, I read the sections of it. I, I didn't think about this. Yeah, even if it is something like viscosity of liquids, we might talk about. But the Bhagavatam talks about something like refreshing is not the flowing is. We could talk about viscosity, but this is different. It's quite striking. In one sense, what is happening here is that. Uh, so we could, if you envision this as a pendulum, is that that we humans uh, may go, may encroach beyond our quota, like tena tek tena bhunji tha, what the Ishwarpanishad talks about. And then, if we, then we can become a destructive influence of the universe. So that we humans having uh, excessive and destructive influence on the universe, we could say is one extreme of the pendulum. But some, you could say, some extreme environmental activists may take the pendulum to the other side and say that humans have no influence on the environment. Or humans, the only, that humans have no role. And like there is this joke sometimes, devotees also tell in classes that if humans were eradicated from the earth, then all problems would be solved on the earth. All its ecological problems would be solved. One way of looking at humanity's role is that it's, we are, we are, uh, disrupting the environment because we are we are encroaching beyond our quota and that is bad but uh, uh, you could say an ex uh, uh, reactive or excessive response could be to say that humans have no role at all on the earth in fact sometimes some i've seen even some devotees make jokes in classes and probably i would say i might also have been guilty of this that that there are some ecologists who say that if humanity were eradicated from the world, there would be no ecological problems because of the extinction of human beings. In fact, most ecological problems would be solved. So normally, if somebody considers, talks about murder, that would be horrible. But here somebody is talking about not just genocide, but what would be the word for eradicating humanity entirely? <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Uh, omnicide, not omnicide, <laughs> omnicide yeah. God, but so normally we would not talk about something like that. So I think that goes to another extreme also to see humans, humanity itself is not a burden. It probably is like the, the idea of a bhar is there in the Bhagavatam, but it is when humanity loses its uh, spiritual orientation, its consciousness degrades. So the degradation of the consciousness of the human beings is the problem. It is not the existence of human beings itself that is the problem. Yes. And, and I'm glad you brought up the Isha Upanishad because that's a, one of the foundations of, uh, of Vaishnav eco-theology, right? Is the understanding that um, each of us has a certain, uh, you know, God-given allotment to live in this world in a simple way. And if we exceed that, which is the, the very foundation, I mean, we can think of Isha Upanishad's statement on an individual level, Right? If, if, I'm, if I'm consuming and throwing things away at an extraordinary pace, I, I will destroy the ecology. We can also think of it in terms of a community level or a national level when nations do this uh, in, the, in the relentless drive to increase GDP and to increase you know, economic growth, uh, more and more consumption just to keep the economic model alive. So when, when, when this sort of consumption approach, uh, Isha Upanishad is rejecting and, and insisting that from any Vaishnava the eco-theology has to begin with a transformation of the heart. Right? That's, that's, where it, um, that's where it starts. Uh, because unless there is an internal transformation, any external rules, regulations, etc. will be a losing battle. Uh, because the the desire from the heart of the living entity is not eradicated. So that's that's not everything we have to say, but it is the starting point, is starting with a, a transformation of the heart to reduce, if not eradicate, this tendency within the heart of the human being for greed, for, um, you know, overconsumption, atyahara prayasascha, Yes, bro. So I think that's an important point. Before we go to that, can I just step back to one yes. point yes. where you mentioned that you put out quite that humans don't walk two inches above the earth. 
hmm. that is not an indic world view so so does this world view come from now i've heard say that this world view comes to some extent from the judeo christian ethos which considers uh, humans to be special that in one sense that the idea is that only humans are going to be delivered by jesus mm-hmm. and it places humanity in one sense above nature now what i have at, over a period of time learned is that it's it's usually for complex phenomena to give a unipolar or a singular explanation it's generally over simplistic because for a complex problem there are multiple causes but uh, how uh, how objective or how fair is it to say that to some extent at least the problems of the environment are associated with a particular theological view of the nature hmm. so um uh, two things i'll say here that uh, it is widely acknowledged that anthropocentrism the idea that human beings are at the center of everything everything is about them and everything is for them to mm. use manipulate rule over uh, that idea has uh, not served us well it's it's caused uh, it's led to a lot of abuse of the natural world animals um and let me say that certain branches of christianity historically have interpreted uh, the genesis story to uh in in anthropocentric terms like right? that that human beings are above they are meant to rule over which means to um manipulate the world around them and they're free to do as they like um but this now in i should say the vast majority of christian denominations has been has been appreciated and repudiated um rejected as being a misinterpretation of the genesis idea and replaced with the idea of stewardship right which still places human beings at the center of the picture but in a a generous fashion as being caretakers of the world and i think what we have to think of as vaishnavas is whether that stewardship model works from a vaishnav perspective or if we have other models to offer uh for the place of human beings in the world whether human beings need to be at the center of the picture at all uh as the ones who are uh, because i i i might say i don't know if we're at the center of the picture or at the top of the picture rather is the right word not center but the top of the picture because we're we're sort of one factor in the middle of many factors right above us are the devas and their will and their engagement with the world and our the importance of us keeping them happy whether through uh, vedic yagyas or sankirtan yagya and then below us is the whole whole world uh so uh, uh, of animals and plants so we're we're more like middle management uh, we're we're not at the apex of the pyramid uh uh if from a from a vaishnav perspective we're important in that we have a um, a huge responsibility towards the world but we're also tied to the world in very uh, deep uh ways a uh, very deep um uh uh ways that that are not necessarily at the top of the pyramid Uh, in terms of life forms in terms of responsibilities and so on so vaishnav yeah. approaches to that may be a little bit different also oh, what you what you are saying is that the presumption that we are the stewards or caretakers underlying that that uh, role is the assumption that we are at the top but within mm-hmm. the vaishnav world view we are not exactly at the top we are more intermediate is that how you are saying that the vaishnava world view might be vaishnava approach to environment might be different from the christian approach yes yes okay yes so, i mean there's many differences but this is i think one one important difference is to think in terms of what is the 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 from a, a dharmic perspective from the perspective of ritta what is the role of human beings and what i what i want to say is that from a vedic perspective the role of human beings is far more interconnected with each aspect of the world 
uh, more in the ways of the way, like, for example, deep ecology thinks of the, um, the natural environment and the ways in which traditional cultures around the world um, uh, uh, have, have seen, have, have thought of um, human beings' place in the world. The, the, uh, uh, rather than at the apex being very uh, deeply interconnected uh, with every aspect of the creation and being one significant element of it. Okay. So just to conclude from a, maybe from a causal perspective then, uh, it was more of a, so you said that may, many branches of Christianity have rejected the uh, anthropocentric reading of the Genesis story. So is this, uh, is this something which is, how do I put it? Like a damage control done to, uh, to av avoid having a negative, the Bible seen negatively. From what I have read, uh, my overall, it does seem that it is more the ascendancy of a, of materialism and a godless view of nature that led to indiscriminate exploitation. Hmm? Yes, I think it would. Yes, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. So it is as three things from what I read is that one is through science and technology we gain more power to control nature, at least in the short term. We didn't really notice fathom what consequences, how it would backfire. Second is that from a philosophical or intellectual perspective, we removed God from nature, that, that there is a higher controlling or being to whom we are accountable. And then we reduced nature itself to more of a, more of, you could say, a mechanism rather than an organism. So mm -hmm. if you consider from the Vedic perspective, there's a Jiva, Jiva Ishwar and Prakriti, so we removed Ishwar from the picture. We overestimated the role of the Jiva. And we, you could say, dehumanized or depersonalized Prakriti. So I don't, I, I, at least I don't think the Christian worldview that we are the, that we are, anthrop that the earth is meant for us, that was the primary thing that contributed. It could be one causal factor. But what, what are your thoughts? I, I love your, that's brilliant, the, the, Analysis according to Ishwara, Jiva, and Prakriti, uh, and and what that's what, where materialism has le left us, uh, and, and 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 led us. Uh, I, I, that's very very nicely stated. Um, I, I totally agree with you that I think it would be wrong to point a finger at Christianity or any other religious tradition. Uh, I I think we live in a world where other religious communities are partners in our pushback against materialism as, uh, and this physicalism as the sum and substance of what human beings are. Every religious tradition agrees that we are answerable to something higher, to someone higher, and that we have to live in accordance with that, and that a, a society driven purely by materialistic ends will end up in destruction, will end up in, in a state of suffering. We, every religious tradition is a partner in a common struggle that we have today. And, and so I think we do ourselves a disservice by hitting ourselves against each other when we've got some much bigger fish to deal with in the ocean. And, and, and you know, especially on your point about damage control, I don't think it's damage control uh, in terms of, you know, uh, the, the re- the 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 uh, the the the, the reinterpretation of the Genesis story and so on. It's you see the way theology works is that any theological resources one has, any religious tradition is not inherently environmentally friendly or inherently environmentally destructive. It's it's all about how the individual practitioners of a tradition understand, explain, and apply their theology, their scriptures, their texts. Right? I, I, I can build an argument very similar to the Christian, the old Christian view of domination from a Vaishya perspective. It doesn't take too much work. Right? Human beings are intelligent creatures. We are 
you get human birth. And that's very, very rare after a long time. Um, uh, Durlabha Manava Janma. Uh, uh, and therefore, we have the ability to control and do what we like with the world. Ultimately, the world is a miserable place. There's no use taking care of the world. And it, our main goal is to escape from the world, to get mukti. Therefore, do what you have to. It doesn't matter what state you leave the world in. Do what you have to and get out of this world and, and, and let it go to hell, right? One can make an argument. Uh, you, have, you use a different set of resources, different set of theological ideas, and you build in a, 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 an, an anti-environmental uh, argument from a Vaishnava perspective. So it's, it's not that any theology or scripture is fundamentally problematic. It's a fact of how do we properly understand uh, the Shastra? How do we properly understand scripture for this uh, and, and, and apply it in a, a siddhantically correct way for our own time and for our own issue? I'll, I'll give you one really nice example of this uh, uh, from, from a book by Professor David Haberman, who's um, a professor of religious studies at the University of Indiana in Bloomington. Uh, I think he has a classic translation of Enodi, no? Act of Devotion. Uh, yes, yes. Yes. Bhaktirasam yeah. Sindhu, he's done a translation. He's written multiple books. He's really a scholar of Braj and all the different traditions that are there in Braj. He recently wrote a wonderful book on, on, um, on Govardhan, on Giridaj, called Loving Stones. And before that, he wrote a book uh, on tree worship in India called uh, People Trees, uh, with the word people being spelled like the English word people, uh, but also uh, with the pun on the word people. Uh, the type of sacred tree in India. And then, and then he, before that, he wrote a book on the Yamuna River called River of Love in an Age of Pollution. And I would recommend anyone who's interested in Vaishnav eco-theology to read these books, really, really beautifully written. And there in the Yamuna book, he says, uh, he, he gives, a, he, he shows the impact that theology has on, on how we engage with the environment, or rather our understanding of theology, our application of it, what impact it has on the environment. Uh, he says that when he went to Braj and he spoke to pilgrims and residents about the level of pollution in the Yamuna, this is now, I don't know, maybe a decade ago. So it's, it, it was, it was um, at a time when this was still being recognized, right? It was still, be, it's still entering the popular consciousness in India. And the river Yamuna was, was deeply, deeply uh, polluted, uh, largely because most of the Yamuna river water was, was, was um, stopped in, in, the, uh, in the dams uh, uh, near Delhi. And, and so, uh, you know, there was very little Yamuna water in Vindavan. I mean, uh, and that problem continues. But anyway, he, he, when he, he asked pilgrims and uh, uh, residents about the pollution in the river, what do you think of this polluted water? He got three responses, three types of responses. Okay. The first was denial. Okay. Uh, the water can not be polluted. Yamuna is eternally pure. And he even had one pilgrim dip his cup into the Yamuna and drink the water and say, see, I'm completely fine. Right. And, um, uh, the second response, so one was to say nothing will happen, Yamuna cannot be polluted, is eternally pure. Number two was to say Yamuna herself is pure, but when we put pollution into the river, then that pollution will negatively affect us. It does not affect Yamuna Devi herself, but it affects us. And the example was given of light pollution. Just like if you're in a big city and you look up into the sky at night, you cannot see any stars, right? But the stars themselves are not affected. They're not damaged. It's that we are uh, um, uh, unable to see the stars. We, it is our loss, not the stars' loss. Right? So this was creating a distinction between what is pavitra and what is swach, uh, pure versus clean. Yamuna is pure, but we have made put pollution or uncleanliness into the river, that will affect us, not Yamuna Devi. That was response number two. Response number three was that 
for centuries, Yamuna Devi has been sustaining and giving us life like a mother, right? Yamuna Maya, like a mother. Now she is sick and ailing as a result of the actions of her own children. We have gone back and made our own mother sick by our behavior. And it becomes our duty to care for her, right? Imagine your mother falling sick and suffering and us being careless about it. It doesn't matter. I don't care what's happening. That how, how can someone who is uh, even a human being, what to speak of a devotee, uh, relate to their mother in this way? So needless to say, environmental consciousness and engagement increased in the order in which I described. The most environmentally active were those who felt that Yamuna Maya, their mother, they had a personal connection with her and felt that she was suffering and it was their duty as her children to take care of her. Uh, still environmentally active, but less was the more human-centered approach. She's fine, but I'm suffering as a result of the pollution. And the, the least amount of interest were those who denied the very possibility of Yamuna waters being polluted. So this is an example of different theologies leading towards different levels of engagement, right? And all three theologies are grounded in a Vaishnav conception, right? None of those people were Gnostics that he was speaking to. None of them were atheists. None of them were, they were all devotees. They were all Vaishnavs who were either pilgrims or visiting Braj. And yet their perspective on the Yamuna, how they applied their theology to Yamuna Devi uh, had a direct impact in, in their engagement with the, world, with, with the environmental issue. Amazing. So, you know, when you first made this point, I thought you were going towards a completely deconstructionist or relativist reading of scripture that, that a tradition has no intrinsic meaning. It is just whatever meaning you read into it. But it is not so much like reading a meaning into it, but there is a basic set of texts, but how you bring those texts together, that can lead to your radically different conclusions. So, yeah, I, I fully agree with this point that we could uh, use the, the, the Bhagavad Gita could be used to say, yeah, why work to do any, deal with anything in the world? Why do work to solve any problems at all? But then we don't see that approach in the Bhagavatam. Say, for example, Prithu Maharaj, when, when his citizens are starving, he doesn't, and they come to him, he doesn't say, yeah, this world is a place of distress, just tolerate it. Mm. He doesn't say that. So, so a lot of responsibility will be there on, uh, there on the contemporary practitioners, and I would say especially contemporary teachers, isn't it? Because with respect to, say, issues which are universal for humanity, then maybe we can look back at the previous acharyas to see how they have handled the issue. But if there are some cont contextual contemporary issues that have come up, what the response of a tradition would be, it depends largely on who is going to speak for the tradition. Hmm. Yes, yes, uh, very important, Prabhu. Yatha dhitam yatha mati. Right? It becomes crucial uh, uh, to, to uh, deeply um, uh, accept and imbibe what we receive from uh, the previous acharyas, and then to explain it in a way that is according to our own realization, that is according to the time, place, and circumstance. And this is the the essential meaning of parampara, right? If we if we don't do that, if we don't take that responsibility seriously that you're describing then essentially we have given up the very idea of Param. Right? This is, this is the, we, we, have, we have stated that Parampara has ended with such and such person, right? It's over. And there, th that at that point, then the further application of the tradition is no longer possible, that its continuity is no longer possible. But we see from Bhagavatam that from Parikshit Maharaj, from Shukadev Goswami to Parikshit Maharaj, from Parikshit Maharaj to Sutta Goswami. Yatha dhitam yatha mati. Right? Each one faithfully transmits what they have received 
and then adds to it but or, or transmits it according to their understanding and the application for the people in front of uh, Shukadev Goswami's application, his audience at the time was Parikshit Maharaj and his needs, right? Of someone who is about to die in seven days. Sutta Goswami's application was different. His audience, the needs of the time were different. It was for us, for the, the impending arrival of Kali Yuga and those sages who were worried about what Kali is going to be. Right? So each, each time Prabhupada's audience and who he's addressing is yet different, right? He, he took science as his great interlocutor because that was the Purva Paksha of his time, right? So th- this is the very meaning of Parampara. And we may not be great Acharyas. We may not, we, we, we are not Srila Prabhupada, right? But the duty to follow in his footsteps and to do our little bit, we may not, like I said, we may not transform the whole world. We may not come up with some grand scheme our, we, the, our duty to do our little bit to practice yathaditam yathamati in our communities, in our neighborhoods, in our society, that is our responsibility. It's a, a great responsibility of every individual devotee. And as you said, especially of teachers who can shape the, the, the entire direction of the community of devotees. Strong. Yeah, so, so maybe just a couple of questions before we finish. I, I appreciate uh, the level we have gone to the discussion. Otherwise, we may have to continue this. this is a very important topic. So, uh, to some extent, we till you talk till now about say what Indic thought is or what you know, the issue of Nishad is. Mm, is there? Uh, if we consider ourselves not just as a representative of the Vedic thought or uh, Vaishnav thought, but Gaudiya Vaishnav thought. So does Gaudiya Vaishnavism itself provide us some distinctive insights about our vision of the environment as contrasted with other other envir- other Vedic school or Vedantic schools of thought? Mm, yes. Yes, there, there are many things that we can contribute which is shared across all the religions of the world. There are many things we can contribute which is shared across all the Indic traditions, Hinduism, Buddhism, Jainism, like that. There are many things that we can share which are, that we can contribute to the environmental problem that, that, that are shared across Vedantic traditions. So, you know, uh, the various uh, um, Vaishnava Vedanta traditions, even Advaita Vedanta, there are various things we can contribute that are shared across the Vaishnavas in particular. And then there are some things that we can contribute which are distinctly Gaudiya Vaishnav contributions and that are maybe not exclusive to our tradition, but are especially emphasized and brought to light and developed by Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and his followers. So, this, this actually leads to a whole section of the discussion that I don't know if you want to pursue in, in brief today or, or say for another time, but we haven't actually gotten into the, the building blocks of what a Gaudiya Vaishnav eco-theology would look like. That is what we, we've been speaking of the need for it, the context for it, the pushback against it, right? And the various arguments that may dissuade someone from engaging, which is all essential foundation building, groundwork. But we haven't actually spoken of those specific aspects of our theology uh, that would lead us to engage with the environment ourselves and also contribute something to the global discourse on ecology. Uh, We've we've not addressed that at all yet. And there's multiple points in that regard that I think think you uh, you would very much enjoy in discussing because I think you could contribute you personally could contribute a lot to it because they're grounded in Bhagavatam, they're grounded in our theology, which you're, of course, very, very learned in. So I think it may be a very interesting uh, discussion or dialogue in terms of some uh, kathas, some philosophical points, leelas that I, I would like to bring up. And, uh, and I'm sure you would be able to bring up uh, many things as well. I think it would be a very rich discussion. 
So it's up to you, Pro, uh, how you want to approach. Good point. Then maybe we could do this in two parts. So today we build up the need need for it, and then next part we could have a discussion. I have done a three-part series, in fact, on ethics in ethics and Krishna conscious ethics and ISKCON. I've been doing with Ras Mandal Prabhu, so we've been developing it over multiple podcasts. So we could do that, I think, because as I said, we don't. That is the core. subject of what we want to discuss and we won't be able to we like, won't do justice to it if we rush through it yes so maybe i'll just ask one more we'll arrange one more point and i can summarize and we'll finish so when we talk about say you said that it is important for us or the leaders of our tradition to take responsibility as the essence of a parampara so in general there are within a living tradition there is a wide number of people with uh, with very different approaches to the world itself mm -hmm. and we see that there are many different with even this way environmental friendly living co friendly living we have many different devotees leaders doing many different things of how to implement eco friendly living so as individual devotees Mm. when we look at nature or we no, i would say not so much nature but when we deal with uh, when we go about our daily lives we could explore this a little bit later but in the next session but is there something simple which we could add that could make us a little more eco conscious in our day to day living they like prabhupada said when you drink water think of the taste of water as krishna now that's that's wonderful that's krishna consciousness i'm not sure that is going to enhance our environmental consciousness but anything that maybe you have adopted personally in your life or something which uh, you feel which is not a difficult thing to do but it is also a way to bring krishna consciousness into our life yes um it, the um uh, the, the, i'm i'm very happy you asked this question uh, simply because there is no automatic um translation or sequence from theology to action uh, the the beautiful. the history of religion is replete with examples of beautiful theologies and ideals that are either misapplied or not applied at all uh, and that leads to all kinds of misery in the world was it immanuel kant who said that from from that there is no line from facts to values from what is to what should be was that kant or i I'm, i'm not sure but that sounds that this is this is very nice what you're describing i'm not sure who said it okay anyway go ahead yeah yeah so uh, yeah one could give many examples of that that gap but 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 that it's a, i think it's a very well known gap one doesn't have to work very hard to prove it uh i think it's more difficult to recognize this in one's own tradition it's easier to point it out in other people's traditions the lack of uh sequence from uh, ideal theology to to a practical application but this is true in in our tradition as well right uh, it's because we human beings are are imperfect uh, in our application of what is a perfect uh gift from the lord in terms of our philosophy and siddhanta so um it's very nice that you ask this question about application and of course we can get into it in in much more detail in our next part uh but uh this is something i'll i'll raise in detail but i think the 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 one thing that we can do is something that shila prabhupad uh emphasized on on a uh, on multiple occasions that that when we see any type of um i i don't like to use the word resource uh but when we see any kind of resource or natural element or anything in our lives that we recognize it as krishna's energy as his shakti as belonging to him and therefore not something that we have the right to overuse or waste regardless of what who's paying for it regardless of how much abundance there is of it people in places where there's a lot of water they think ah it doesn't matter there's so much water here let the people in you know india worry about not enough water 
or or people who have who who um who who think no i'm 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 working for a greater cause therefore the exception applies to me i can use uh, or damage the environment because i'm working for something greater right no we understand as devotees that everything belongs to krishna it's krishna's shakti and therefore regardless of the abundance or availability or who's paying for it or whether it's cheap or expensive we think no this electricity this water this everything that is there this is krishna's shakti and i think our shakti theology is very crucial for this perspective for understanding and therefore we minimize its usage as far as possible and this is directly this is all a preview of next time but this is directly the 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 ethos of vairagya vairagya doesn't mean giving up the world it means recognizing that nothing in the world belongs to me it belongs to the lord and therefore just as i would not waste something that you give me to borrow i would use only it as much as i need to and then return it carefully to you so why should i waste overuse over consume something that doesn't belong to me that belongs to the lord mm beautiful thought yeah i think many places in our temples and the ashrams we put you know don't waste krishna's water don't waste krishna's electricity turn off the lights so the simple things but they they can actually be be expressions of a deep level of devotional appreciation for krishna's gifts also yeah, yeah wonderful thought true in one yeah. sense we start I, we re- realizing the value of things when we don't have them very easily yeah. but uh, the way you put it is even when we have it easily if we recognize that this is actually something which krishna has given me yeah. then then abundance doesn't even the abundance doesn't won't make us take it for granted Wonderful. Yes, I remember one little incident in Prabhupada Nectar series by Satsuru Maharaj. The little little books, uh, little anecdotes of Prabhupada. One particular story uh, where Prabhupada is uh, in a temple and he's he's walking with devotees. I think he's just returned from a morning walk, and he turns to them and says, "They have eyes, but they cannot see." And devotee, and then he continues walking, and devotees are thinking. this must be a very deep philosophical point what is prabhupada trying to say here you know in terms of our inability to see krishna or whatever then he stops again and he says they have eyes but they cannot see and he points to a light bulb which is running on outside in broad daylight right and he says look it's running is right there and you cannot see it right uh, go turn it off so prabhupada was very very practical like this okay i had heard another story that propada in mayapur and somewhere a tap was just dripping a few drops of yes. water so they ca- they can't see is for light huh? amazing yeah. so beautiful i think this is a very very sweet note to conclude this so should i just quickly try to summarize what we discussed through before we Please. find up yes so today we discussed uh, broadly on the uh the re- relevance of gaudiya vaishnavism in terms or relevance of krishna consciousness bhakti theology in terms of the environmental crisis facing the world so broadly i think four or five points we discussed we started by how this uh, i mentioned the four points of mindfulness yoga veganism and uh, environmentalism and you mentioned about two points that the attitude toward women and especially environmental that is like a make or break for people with respect to how they see uh spiritual traditions then with respect to the environment specifically we discussed how while the the problem itself is grave uh specific measures what to do what not is become politicalized but because it has become politicalized we can bring in a fresh perspective from a from our theological perspective and then you said that this is what we should be doing as a tradition and then you talked about jiva goswami although he was he embodies the summit of renunciation still he is so socially engaged that he his his writing of his will is the first legal existing legal document that we have of that kind so he was a legal expert and the fact that rindavan was our our temples were mostly 
Goswami Temple were preserved despite Aurangzeb's reign of terror was because Jiva Goswami had arranged for the protection by working with the Rajput kings. So if he as an announcer is so engaged, then those of us who are in the world, how much more we should be engaged? And uh, that's beautiful. Talk also, Prabhupada also was was had foresight to talk about simple living and high thinking. So cow, cow's land and Krishna. And then how do we translate it into today's world? In those terms, we discussed about when we, when the environmental crisis is there. What are the what are the causes of it? If we went into that, it's <clears throat> rather than attributing it to a particular religion. we can attribute it to a particular ideology that's anthropocentrism and that could have arisen from many causes not just one religion so we avoid like unipolar explanations and then within that we discuss from our traditions perspective that we don't have to uh, jump so i talked about how we shouldn't be you mentioned that we shouldn't be just using this a devotee should not be hypocritical or superficial at inside and out so with a deep level of understanding of what our theology says when we engage then there will be an authenticity to it and others may try to use us because because you say even secular environmental activists have recognized that spiritual traditions are required for bringing sustainable change in people's lifestyles so they may want to use us so to prevent that from happening we shouldn't jump on the bandwagon of whatever ideas they come up with we have to see what our theology says and then to say the world is a very beautiful place on on say world earth day or something that is a fad today and yes there is beauty in the world but there is also distress in the world and if we bring that point in paradoxically it can actually decrease decrease the distress of environmental activists because then their baseline expectation changes they otherwise feel that why is the world not becoming a better place so other or they may start even this amount of misanthropy where they start hating human beings so humans don't have a excessive role that we don't have to encroach on others quota but humans have a valuable role in society uh, in in the ecological system in one sense we fulfill the purpose of creation by uh, by having that capacity for spiritual realization as the bhagavatam says and then with respect to humanity's contribution two three things that uh, the the theological understanding from christianity is that it, we are human beings are caretakers or uh, caretaker stewards now our understanding might be a little more nuanced because we don't see ourselves either at the center or even at the summit within the environment we are intermediate because our ours are devtas so what would be our role in the environment that is something which has to be explored but broadly we could say that as devotees as representatives of vedic tradition it is important for us to engage and then uh, another point which was quite strikingly when you talked about the attitude towards the pollution of yamuna in that there was denial there was uh, it's not a problem at all or that it is a problem at a transcendental level not a practical level yamuna is affected we are not affected but rather third is that we have made our mother sick so we have to heal her now so that means uh, whatever be the basic text of a theology how those texts are read or interpreted that depends on the uh, current leaders of the traditions so how they are understood explained and applied and that's where we need to be responsible in our presentation of the of gaudiya vaishnava theology and uh, with respect to the problem that we face today it's more because of materialism by which the understanding of jiva ishwar prakriti all three have been distorted it's not due to any specific religion and we we by hitting out at each other we do a disservice to the bigger cause that we all have to work on today and lastly you mentioned that the way we can bring environmental consciousness into our daily lives is by being aware that whatever resources we are using they are krishna's energies so even if we don't have scarcity that doesn't mean we take it for granted but we use them uh, we use it cautiously any points you would like to add and no prabhu as usual your summaries are wonderful they're perfect you said it all better than i could say it
it was excellent <laughs> i think i missed a few points but uh, it's good it's wonderful actually i look forward to our next discussion yes true i i look forward to it uh, very much um i think it will be lots of fun thank you very much for joining today hari krishna hari krishna thank you prabhu